This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast, and here we are, once again, talking more ML, AI, data science, and other assorted fun with Alexi. Are you ready? Are you ready for part two, Jan? I'm ready to continue this book camp. Let's do this thing. <laughs> I, I, I think I know the answer to this based on what you were saying earlier, but just to check, I, the we talked about like who should be using sort of you know ML based solutions. Like, is there anyone that that shouldn't? Yeah, so it seems like sometimes that uh, machine learning is like the silver 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 bullet, right? It's not mm -hmm. always the silver bullet because machine learning adds complexity. So you need to have your, uh, it's called training pipeline. So you, you get all the data and then you need to prepare the data. You need to uh, do some, it's called, this process is called feature engineering. When you, it's basically a bunch of scripts that take data and compute extra columns in your data. So you need to do all that. And then at the end, you need to have a table with just numbers that you can put into a machine learning model. So all this process is complicated, right? So it's a lot of code. This code has to be um, deployed somewhere. It needs to run reliably, right? So that's a lot of complexity and a lot of overhead because you need to maintain it. So if you want to run this every day, right? So then you should think, oh, okay, where do I deploy it? Like, do I have, a, do I need an airflow cluster? Then in addition to all these problems you had, now you also have to manage an airflow cluster, right? So it, uh, like it escalates quickly, right? And then, um, at the end, you have a lot more things to look after. And if it's something simple that you can just do, you can just fix with an if statement. Like if there is a word, uh, I don't know, porn, then don't publish this content. Mm -hmm. right? So maybe at the beginning, you can just get away with something as easy as that. And of course, over time, this system with rules will get more and more complicated. Uh, and then uh, then it's probably time to start using machine learning when just simple fixes like that, simple rules do not work anymore. And uh, yeah. yeah, and probably having an, some, like before you do machine learning, having some analytics in place also helps. And analytics yeah. is about, you know, instead of uh, using data for predicting, you use data for understanding what's happening. And it's usually about executing like many, many SQL queries and trying to understand what's happening. And for example, let's say, coming back to this example with uh, content moderation. So we see that there is some content that we don't want on our platform. And we think, okay, should we use machine learning for this before starting and going to, I don't know, downloading TensorFlow and spending, uh, <laughs> I don't know, a lot of money on TensorFlow courses. Um, what you can do is you can just ask ourselves, uh, is uh, like is this a big problem? Do we have mm. actually a lot of cases when this happens? Or is it just, you know, 10? And if it's 10, then maybe how about just people, you know, just every day open the page and uh, just remove yeah. this manually? Yeah. It it sort of like my my like very simplistic view would be that the two things that would exclude someone from going down this journey would be one, if you don't have the right data in the first place, like if you don't have yeah, something yeah. you can feed into this process, then like don't either don't start or go and figure out how to get the data. And then the other thing is like this is a this is a journey, this is an investment you're gonna to need to go on. You need to make sure that you know the ROI makes sense. Like investing all of this time, effort, people, skills into something that is going to be a reasonably significant endeavor for most organizations. And they need to make sure that the problem that they're trying to solve is of an appropriate scale that this investment makes sense. And it's not just like a, a one hit wonder. It's like this will then grow beyond you know, what it initially starts as. Mm -hmm. A question from me. I mean, you can explain that you start with statistics and just human things until it becomes too big and then you go to machine learning. Now, machine learning, you have the, the, the normal machine learning, regression, classification, things like that. Then you have the deep learning. So you, call, you talked about TensorFlow already. That's 
a leap further, right? Now, I can see it's kind of inevitable that if you become po if your team becomes popular, you will move into the regular machine learning step, just to, it gets too big too much. Is it also inevitable that you will at some point reach a point you will have to go to, to, to deep learning? Or do you see deep learning more as another part, bifurcation more lower down, depending on the problem case, you will either use regular machine learning or deep learning, or is it really a maturity, go one step higher from machine learning to deep learning? Yeah, so when we talk about deep learning, usually, um, first of all, deep learning requires a lot more, um, like it requires the right hardware. So usually mm -hmm. it's bigger models, they're a lot slower. So if you want your models to respond in a reasonable time, then you need to invest into GPUs and whatnot. Then it becomes very expensive. And uh, yeah, so usually you like the research phase of this thing, playing with this deep learning is cool, right? Because it's like, okay, everyone on Twitter is talking about that. And now I am also, I can also go on Twitter and say that I'm playing with deep learning. But in reality, <laughs> uh, it adds so much complexity and it becomes so much more expensive than traditional approaches that you, you, want in general to avoid unless you have a good reason for this and i think this is what you actually said in your question so like you should definitely start with simple things and there are cases when you need deep learning so in this case these cases are usually uh, related to so-called unstructured data so and a good example of that would be to so structure data is when we can represent it as a table a table in your sql database uh, then this is a structured uh, data. So most of this data is structured already. So like, I don't know, in e-commerce, you have uh, listings there and for, for listing, you have title, description, uh, I don't know, price, quantity, like all these things. So it, like it had some structure, right? But when you go to, again, speaking about e-commerce and the listings, so one, some of these columns, let's say there is a column images, and then the images are already unstructured, right? And you cannot just take an image and put it into a traditional model because you, in order to put it into a model, you need to turn this into a bunch of numbers. And uh, this is what deep, learn, deep learning is effectively doing. So it looks at the image and it somehow converts this image into um, simply put a big array, right? And this big array, uh, let's say the, this array is like, I don't know, with 1000 digits. This is something that you can just take and put this into machine learning. So this is what deep learning is doing for us. It's converting this unstructured uh, information like images, like text, like sounds, like videos into representation that we can use uh, in machine learning. And for many problems, you don't need to do this because you already have the data in a table. And if it's just numbers, then yeah, you can just go ahead and use simple things. No? Yeah, so it depends on application. Yeah. The the example I always like, uh, of, uh, I'm pretty sure it's deep learning, was the, the, the one where someone had a, uh, a camera pointed, I think it was just pointed out of their window uh, at the sort of the car parking sort of spaces available to them. And then they wrote some relatively simple, I guess, I mean, looked incredibly complex to me, but sort of code that basically figured out, you know, is there a free car parking space that they can move their car into or are all the car or are all the spaces taken up already by, you know, cars or motorbikes or whatever? Um, and like, you know, that that's, you've got a bunch of image processing that basically leads to a, a series of like, if there are five car parking spaces, then it's either a one if it's occupied or a zero if it's empty, but it's the image processing that leads to the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a very good example. So uh, this is a good example when you need to use deep learning indeed. And uh, this is not as difficult as it sounds actually. So at the end, you said you have one if it's occupied, zero when it's not occupied. So here you can take your video stream and then you can, you can cut it because like your camera is probably static. It's not like moving. Mm. It's just always pointing yeah. to the same direction. So you know which are pixels for this car parking mm -hmm. slot, which what are the pixels range we have for this car parking slot and so on. So you can 
you can divide your picture into like a grid, so to say, mm -hmm. and then in each cell of this grid, you would say you would have a parking lot, right? And then you take this mm -hmm. cell and you say, okay, now in this image, I see that this cell, this cell, and this cells are occupied and these cells are free. And then you stack mm -hmm. this and then you get like a small patch and then this patch of data or with this patch of image, you feed into a image classification model. Mm. And then it's actually real, you don't need a lot of data even for training this. And that's actually mm. something I talk in a book too. Like how can you, when you don't have a lot of data, how can you build a model that can recognize something? And the example we have in the book is about classifying Im images of clothes. So let's say you have an image of a t-shirt and it would tell you that this is a t-shirt. And the trick here is that there are companies like Google who already trained big, big models. These models saw a lot of data, a lot of images in the past. And we can take this image, uh, we can take these models and it, this process is called fine tuning or transfer learning. So basically we take all this, all this effort that somebody else put and we adjust our model a little bit to now solve this specific problem of saying if this car parking slot is empty or free. Right, or is this image of a t-shirt or not? And yeah, it's it's actually a lot easier than it sounds and you need zero math actually to um, to implement something like this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that's, that's the power of a lot of these, you know, pre-trained libraries or, you know, pre-trained solutions and services that you can potentially, if you know what you're doing, kind of hook together. But it is, so we touched a little bit earlier around um, like ML being embedded in more more applications, more solutions, there are more libraries available, there are more pre-trained models available that you can hook together. So do you think that we've reached, the, and the, also the, the no-code solutions or no-code or low-code solutions you mentioned. So do you think we've reached the point where most regular people that at least are dipping their toes into this kind of situation do they really need to concern themselves too much with what's happening in these underlying libraries systems solutions or like do you think it's reached the level of i guess either maturity or even acceptability if that's even a word of you can just hook a bunch of things together and if it works, it works. Like, are we at that level of maturity or not yet? I think so, To some, for some applications, yes. So let's say yeah. if we want to build a system for uh, this detecting if a car, car parking slot is free or not, mm -hmm. you can just glue a bunch of things together and it will work. And uh, like, why do you need to know like how a backpack back propagation works in neural networks you don't <laughs> right? you don't even need to care what that this particular phrase exists right mm -hmm. let alone understanding what's happening behind but if you work on a cutting edge research and you you want to come up with mm. new ways of uh, i don't know classifying images or whatnot then you probably need to have a very good understanding how these things work right in order to yeah. come up with something new but as a practitioner Maybe there is another example. Uh, let's say, do you need to know how TCP IP works to build a web service? Yes. yes. <laughs> <Obviously>. <laughs> to what extent? Like, do you know? Do you need to know, like, um, I don't know, how SSL handshake works? Uh, like, if yeah. all you need to do is just, you know, uh, respond to, to an incoming request. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, need to really? Do you need to know the entire OSA stack and be able to recite it forwards and backwards? Realistically, not, uh, not anymore. I compare yeah. it with cars. Because like 50 years ago, everybody could maintain and rebuild their own cars. It was something you kind of did. Today, <laughs> if I open the bonnet of my car, I say, yes, that's an engine. And I close <laughs> it again. I do well, miss something there because I, I stand by the side of the road when I might just be able to fix it myself. I just don't understand. So do you need to? No. But depending on what's, how important it is, I mean, if a car is really, really important for me, I mean, I die if I can't drive, for example, I kind of need to know. But yeah, those are 
exceptional circumstances, of course. No. Yeah, I guess if I, you work at Facebook and you really need to tune your Nginx so it can exactly. process, I don't know, 1% um, or even like one uh, tenth of percent more requests, then yeah. But if you're just in the regular e-commerce uh, settings with not a lot of, uh, or I don't know, like if you manage a forum somewhere, right, in a very niche community, mm -hmm. Then, uh, like you might not even know that you have some sort of like, uh, what's the difference between Nginx and Apache? I don't know. It just runs. Yeah, yeah. Just but a like, website that type the things and it works. Yeah. I, I, like I think Bloom there is sort of problem. Yeah. And doesn't cause I, I more think, problems. Sorry, Dave. I'm, I'm interrupting all the no, time. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think there are like there are also two other extremes to your to your point, though, Jan. Like one is, like the one extreme is. You know, you, actually, if you've got a, a really modern day EV, like there is, there is potentially not even a bonnet for you to open. There is and literally, you'll kill yourself. you've got, you've got a little port that you can pour the windscreen washer <laughs> fluid in, and that's it. That's your entire serviceable, uh, serviceable com user serviceable components. But the the other end is, and I I saw I saw something uh, I think a couple of weeks ago that basically said. Like 50 or 60 years ago, your owner's manual for your car like told you how to adjust the the valve clearances on your engine. And like today's like owner's manuals for cars basically tell you not to drink the battery <laughs> fluid or whatever it is. And like the, the sort of the level of I mean it's 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 not it's not just dumbing down. That's that's overly simplifying things, but it's Things have got to such a high degree of complexity that we don't really want people messing with some of the internals of these things because they are so incredibly complicated. And instead, we want to you know, make sure that those things are dealt with by individuals that have that level of skill and experience uh, to be able to you know, manipulate those things. I think that's important, too, because your target audience gets a little broader. The beginning of yeah. the car industry, if you had a car, you knew what the thing was and had the money to buy one, you really, you knew what that thing was. Machine learning 10 years ago, if you're doing some machine learning, it costs a lot of money. You need to know what you're doing because there was nothing off the shelf. So you had to have that knowledge. Now, anybody is using ML. It needs to be dumbed down because you can't expect people that have made a that don't have a PhD or a master in this. You can't expect people to understand it. It's just not feasible. Yeah. I think maybe to kind of switch topics a little bit, um, you sort of created the um, the the kind of data talk clubs to help people sort of understand and and kind of drive a bit of education um, of the you know this sort of side of things. Like, how do you think that has maybe changed or helped the way that people understand? These kind of topics around uh, around around this space. I never actually thought about like how exactly it helps uh, or in which way it helps people. Yeah. Uh, but the feedback uh, I'm getting from this, maybe like uh, I'll just say say a few words about what this actually yeah. is before going. So the data, so Data Talks Club. This is an online community. And what it means is uh, first the, a Slack group where people can ask and answer questions or um, just uh, talk to each other. Then it's also regular events. So we have webinars, workshops, uh, podcast interviews like this one too, but I'm the podcast host. Uh, yeah, it's actually funny to be a guest uh, every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Doing well so far. <laughs> Um, I, as a podcast uh, host, I usually try to not say too much, but here I feel like it's opposite. I'm just, uh, you know, talking a lot more than like sometimes as a podcast <laughs> host, I am yeah. like when a guest talks too much, I think, okay, like how should they stop them? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like I'm now this, this kind of guest. <laughs> anyway, so where I was, um, so yeah, Data Talks Club. So this is a place for people to hang out. So it's for people who um, like data. So it can be data engineering, machine learning, data science, machine learning engineering, um, all data related things. And it started like a, without any ambitions or anything. And just, okay, let's create a Slack group. And then somehow 
accumulated over time. And the feedback I get from people like, hey, I attended the webinar and then I went ahead and tried all the suggestions from the webinar and they got a job. This is very nice to receive, even though for me, I didn't actually do the webinar. It's the, the speaker who came and they did the webinar, right? Uh, and it helped somebody. So that's uh, that's very nice. This is a very good feeling. Uh, so I guess I'm not sure if it's answering your question, but it's to, to I don't know, make it easier for people to get access to this content, uh, mm -hmm. to data related content. And uh, more importantly, also to discuss it, to have a place to chat with each other. Yeah. Do you think that you mentioned um, uh, something earlier on in the, the conversation around like people spending lots of money on TensorFlow courses and, you know, the, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of free stuff out there. There's communities like this. There's, um, you know, p th various things that competitions that people can like Kaggle that people can sign up for and, you know, participate in to learn. How do you think the like the education space around machine learning, AI, data science has has evolved over the, the last few years? Yeah, well, I can tell you like mm. maybe a little bit uh, behind the scenes. So my book is not mm. selling that well. And I think the reason for that is because the market is saturated. What I mean by this mm. is there are so many, many good books, so many books in general, so many courses mm -hmm. that it's very hard to compete with them and which is a good situation for for somebody or well, good and bad right so if you're just starting in machine learning you have mm. so much stuff for free that like all it requires from you is your time so then time and commitment you can just yeah. start learning and then you don't need to pay a lot of money for i don't know for for the courses you just uh, need to have enough uh uh, patience, I guess, yep. to um, to work through this content. And then it creates another problem, right? So as a beginner, you see all this abundance of materials mm. online. How do you select this one? And I guess this is another thing that community can help uh, with. You can just ask, okay, what do you think about this course? Uh, but on the other hand, when I see questions like this, like, okay, I am like, I'm not sure which course to take this one or this one my answer would be just take any just take three courses mm. and then yeah mm. that's all you need three different courses doesn't matter or not even three courses three things can be books mm. courses uh anything else and the, the the number three here is good because everyone uh, delivers context content differently everybody mm -hmm. has different styles and then different points of view, different angles from which they cover. So, for example, in my book, it's very practical. But maybe some mm -hmm. people would wish that there was more theory, right? So maybe there is another book that provides more theory. And when you consume three different sources, you get to see this thing you're learning from three different angles. And then you have a very good overview. And then another thing I would say is uh, courses are good, but uh, don't just get stuck with courses two projects and yeah. this is more important because right now there is so much material you it will take entire life just to watch all the machine learning courses and i am contributing to to the noise <laughs> even more by publishing <laughs> the content <laughs> and there are so many people at the same time as me are doing the same thing so it's uh, yeah you, it will take ages for you to watch all these courses so don't just pick a couple of them and then put this knowledge in practice so that's what I would say. And yeah, it's all free. Like, it's amazing. I, I, I'd say one thing I do look for, especially in a, a subject matter like machine learning that's evolving so quickly. I mean, things that were hyped five years ago are not used anymore because we've moved on. And with all the books out there, some curation would be nice. Because if I'm starting out and I'm picking up a book, I might be unlucky and read stuff that nobody uses anymore. Well, it's still mm -hmm. valid. The concepts behind are still valid, yeah. but still I want to yeah. do a project and I just can't move on because the tools that the book recommends me don't exist anymore or have moved on or have changed too much. So that's the hardest thing, finding something that's good. But as you said, 
take three books and with the togetherness you will get goodness out of it but getting something that's fresh enough yeah because a date stamp it also depending on what country it comes from it's that's a tough one mm -hmm. yeah and to, uh, again yeah. like uh, some people think they need a mentor who will help them pick up the right resources uh but yeah it's um just too much to ask, hey, can you be my mentor? Because it's too much of a commitment. And when I receive messages like this, I don't even know how to politely answer that. Because if I just write note with a point at the end, that is too, you know, <laughs> doesn't mm -hmm. look <laughs> good. It's not like, yeah, yeah uh, go away, I don't want to see you. Right? Uh, so this is definitely not what I want to say, but like, how do I politely decline this request? Because this is so much commitment. I think this is, you don't actually need a mentor, but maybe a community where you can ask people, yeah. hey, what do you think yeah. about this book? And then somebody would say, hey, but it teaches this thing and it's in Java and this thing doesn't exist, in, or like it's not updated, it's not maintained anymore. Look at this one, it's better. And I recently, I don't know, learned from this and it went, it went well, I really liked it. So yeah, having a place for discussing these things. And I think um, like local meetups uh, work also for this thing quite well. We don't do local meetups. Um, we just um, mostly do uh, online stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. like if you're in a relatively big city, maybe just uh, you know go to meetup.com and see if there is a like a data science or machine learning meetup in your area. And that's it for the second part of the interview with Alexei. More goodness yet to come in the next episode, but of course, already a big thank you to Alexi for joining us for this podcast. Any closing wisdom words from you? I have no wisdom left. It's it's all been used up. Then just let's just close it. It is all the time you have for today, everybody. You can support this podcast. You can become a patron. Contributions do help us keep this up and running. We are on YouTube. You can like, subscribe, hit notification bells, do YouTube fun stuff. You can also go to www.rordingout.org. There's links to the Patreon page, the YouTube page, and more information about the podcast. And you can follow me on Twitter using the ad rolling elephant tag. You can also still send your feedback by plain old email to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is I want that TensorFlow hardware. Yon. And my name is Artificially Intelligent Dave. Take no substitute. <laughs> we look forward <laughs> to talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. See you then.